now. Okay. Awesome. Now you're live. We are started. So, hello, my friends. Hey. What's up? We're very excited to have you here. And as our listeners might know, you're coming to Sofia, Bulgaria for a seminar on 10th of June. And this is sort of like an interview uh, that we'll have to prepare the audience for what they're about to experience if they really join in that session. And we want to pick your brain on a number of topics. I think you every interview with you that I've listened to starts with your history of how you got into fitness. So I think if anyone has heard anything about you, they, they know your story. So I think uh, also because you only have like 30 minutes, we should get into it. And the first question that we wanted to ask is, we obviously we're enrolled in your course and we know about your principles of exercise selection and they really, really work, but we want you to elaborate on them. And you have an old article uh, that features seven principles, but you have 10 now, as far as I remember, mm -hmm. or maybe even more. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually restructuring them uh, again to see uh, differentiate a bit more between exercise ordering and selection. Uh, but yeah, you can still find that article to give a, a primer. It's pretty dated by now, especially the exact exercises I use. Uh, but it was a very, um, it's still the framework I use because many people, they select their exercises based on a convenience or, you know, what other people do. And they don't really have any, um, any framework that they apply for why you are selecting a certain exercise and not another. So many people, for example, with uh, barbell exercises, they have this idea that say a deadlift or a barbell row that they rank very high on like must do exercises, but it's only because these exercises have been done for so long, they're, they're traditional. So if you think about, for example, a regular deadlift, many people think, okay, deadlift is a great mass builder because all the jack guys, they deadlift, but if you then make them think about the principle involved in a selection, for example, that lift is a purely concentric muscle action. You lift the weight up, but during the descent, there is minimal resistance. So the muscles are shortening, but they are not lengthening under load. And a very important principle that we find in the research literature is that uh, during the lengthening contractions, the eccentrics, you actually get greater muscle growth generally, or at least equal as during the concentric. And it's best therefore to have dynamic contractions which means you have both the concentric and the uh, eccentric contraction in the same movement. But during a deadlift, people don't do it and they, they don't think about that. They have no rationale for it. So that article is, um, to my knowledge, actually the, the first framework that was put online. And I think it still ranks number one on Google for exercise selection. It used to do that for years, actually, um, where, um, I created these a set of rules basically that allow you to systematically optimize your exercise selection and not just go from, oh, I do this or that uh, for whatever reason, but actually have a set of principles to follow. And based on these principles, you come to certain movements and then, okay, these are the exercises you want to do. And often, uh, what we'll also show in the seminar is you come up with new exercises or variations of exercise that are just a bit different than other exercises. Uh, I like to use a lot of cables, for example, to use um, one of the principles of exercise selection that you want to match the exercise resistance curve to your own strength curve, which means that uh, you don't have these clear pronounced sticking points that many people um, sort of intuitively experience as not being uh, ideal. Uh, some machines, for example, have uh, several sticking points. If you're working out on a very old machine and it has like uh, poor cable traction, you get these kind of uh, points where you, you can press it up a little bit and then it sticks and then you have to pass through that point and then you can accelerate the weight again and it feels off. It doesn't feel right. So um, you can actually uh, graph this and there's a lot of research on it. And then you can biomechanically determine what the exercise's resistance curve is, match it to your own capacity to produce forth, force. And um, if you do that, you get a great muscle contraction throughout the whole motion rather than just at one point of the exercise. Yeah, that's... Yeah, like, like Bayesian curls. Yes, exactly. Like uh, Bayesian curls. They are a modification of uh, dumbbell or barbell curls. And if you do them right, uh, they are used. Uh, use a cable and you can uh, alter your body in just a little bit 
using the um, the correct positioning of the cable and then you alter your body position a little bit throughout the movement and if you do it right you'll notice that you get not only a great stretch uh, which many people experience for example during uh, incline curls but you also get the nice uh, contraction that you get from certain variants of concentration curls for example that Arnold was famous for popularizing so you get the best of what many people experience in different exercises all in one exercise and as far as I remember also you sometimes use tempo to achieve this for certain specific exercises so can yeah. you give us an example yeah one of the um, more advanced principles that I use is uh, what I call accommodating tempo training and which is not in that article and it's one of my newer methods and basically what you do is certain exercises when you cannot biomechanically change the resistance curve you can use your uh, tempo your training tempo so your cadence how fast you're lifting uh, to accommodate the resistance curve so during a bench press for example you could uh, lower the weight more slowly during the initial part of the descent because you are stronger at that point but one uh, especially during the point when the elbow goes behind your body then the long head of the triceps loses a lot of its uh, biomechanical leverage which means you are a lot weaker there and it's the reason why most people experience the sticking point uh, within the first half of the exercise and with tempo training you could therefore uh, lower it more slowly during the first 50 percent during, during the last 50 percent of the exercise and this takes some um, learning because it's basically the exact opposite of what a powerlifter does because th their competition rules force them to pause in the bottom position which is why a lot of people do that as well but that is a judging criteria it's not something that powerlifters made up to uh, maximize muscle growth simply for the judges to say okay you really reached the bottom position uh, there's a clear point um, a clear cutoff point for when the rep ends you press it back up you lock it out you have another clear point easy to judge very objective but it's very different from training as a bodybuilder yeah and a lot of bodybuilders actually still cling into the idea of time under tension and and tempo training and what is actually the most important factors for hypertrophy so not one two but maybe like if you give us a broader example because i know also um some people believe muscle damage is a factor you personally as far as I know, don't support that. So can you please elaborate a bit? Right, yeah. I have um, an article actually in the, in the making uh, about that, what really causes muscle to grow. And largely based on the work of Brad Schoenfeld, the current paradigm that a lot of people have is that you have three factors, muscle damage, metabolic stress, and biomechanical tension. And these are three different pathways, sort of, that all lead to muscle growth. And that is... Um, a fundamental principle that many people base their programming on and what they do is they try to sort of activate all these three pathways so you have for example um, it's also used as a rationale for um, undulating periodization uh, which I agree with its use but for different reasons that uh, during one workout you activate uh, a lot of or facilitate a lot of metabolic stress and then in a different workout or with different exercises you do a lot of muscle damage uh, however, uh, for muscle damage, for example, there is, you still there, by the way? I think your, uh, you. your connection is, uh, uh, right. yeah, yeah, you're back. Yeah, sorry. Right. So, yeah, if you look at the research on muscle damage, that the original hypothesis that it plays a role in muscle growth uh, is largely based on research on cell tubes, um, in vitro research, so just different cells, um, some animal models. But in human research, uh, the studies that actually look at the correlation between muscle damage and muscle growth, it is not significant. And in fact, uh, we have some research showing that excess muscle damage can decrease muscle growth because it hampers your recovery a lot. So it actually makes a lot of sense that if you damage muscle too much, you uh, you cannot train again for a period of days, which limits your ability to cause new muscle growth during that period. And modern research that we have, it's actually a really good study uh, by Damas et al, uh, shows that it also directly limits muscle protein synthesis. So what happens when you're introducing new exercises in a program 
and they do a lot of muscle damage, you get very high rates of muscle protein breakdown. And you also get high levels of muscle protein synthesis, but which many people interpret it as being very beneficial. But if you actually look at net balance, it's not beneficial. At best, you can get the same effect. And in that study, there was actually a trend for um, a decrease, wasn't statistically significant, but a trend for a decrease in the net uh, or an increase in the net protein balance over time, which suggests that uh, it may be beneficial, in fact, to limit muscle damage rates um, so that net, uh, so that you get basically get more of the protein synthesis can be used to build actually new muscle tissue rather than uh, just repairing the tissue that you damage so excessively in your training. And I think this is especially relevant uh, for high frequency training models, which uh, I employ quite a lot in more advanced lifters because uh, in conventional training programs, especially bro splits where you train <clears throat> a muscle group once a week, then it might actually be advantageous to completely annihilate the muscle group because you have a whole week to recover. And uh, we now know that um, even though uh, you can use the whole week to recover, the actual increase in protein synthesis is probably not going to last the whole week. So there is just a limit to how much muscle growth you can stimulate in one single training session. And this appears to be maybe more than three days in even extreme scenarios. So once you're past this complete untrained or novice level of training status, it's very unlikely that you can cause a muscle to grow for many days after one workout. So if you want to uh, optimize your training program for muscle growth, you want to have a higher training frequency uh, at least twice a week for anyone beyond uh, the absolute novice level and benefits trending to even daily training um, in the literature, uh, which is the high frequency method that is now becoming quite popular from uh, Bayesian bodybuilding, where you're basically doing whole body training every single day in certain cases. Um, I think a lot of people do take this to extremes and think they are more advanced than they are uh, to quickly progress to these methods, but that's a different topic. If you want to benefit from this high frequency training, you definitely have to take muscle damage into account. And if you're training, uh, you're designing your program to sort of activate this muscle damage pathway to get more muscle growth, I think you're shooting yourself in the foot because all you're doing is you're constantly damaging muscle and uh, repairing it, but you're not stimulating a lot of new muscle growth. Yeah. And Actually, you live, you live with the muscle soreness all the time. Mm -hmm. Sorry? You you live with uh, muscle soreness all the time if you train uh, yeah. for muscle damage. Exactly. Yeah. Well, a lot of people find this when they switch exercises a lot um, in their programs. They get a lot of muscle damage and, you know, it feels right. A lot of people, they do things based on how it feels. That's the whole bro bodybuilding method, really. I mean, if you look at it, metabolic stress, it sounds plausible, but it's kind of a rationale for you know, the, the bros that got a nice pump and they like looking at in the mirror when their biceps are pumped. And uh, that's why they did the exercises. And then later this, you know, a lot of people rationalize this as metabolic stress and the soreness that you get. A lot of people, you know, they do an exercise. And like we talked earlier, they don't have this uh, set of principles from science uh, that they base their exercise selection on. So they, what do you do? You, you go by your feeling. So afterwards, you know, you get sore, you know, that muscle, mu that must be working that new exercise. But uh, really what happens is uh, when you're constantly changing up your exercises, it's also something uh, a lot of coaches do, but muscle uh, confusion. yeah, muscle confusion, <laughs> what I call muscle confusion, confusion, because <laughs> they say you want to avoid adaptation, but adaptation is the whole goal of training. Muscle growth is the adaptation to the training. So um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, if you're constantly changing up your exercises, then uh, it makes people feel like they're progressing really well because they feel the muscle damage and you know it's a new exercise, provides variety. Many people um, like that, anything that's novel, anything that's new, you know, spark up interest in your training. Uh, and it's very easy to progress on a new exercise. But most of that, what we know from the literature is just they are purely neural adaptations. Once you do a new exercise, your brain, it learns to control the movement and you get a lot better simply at coordination. 
balance, stability. You know, your brain learns when to fire uh, a certain muscle and another make the movement a lot more smooth. And that's why you get a lot stronger very fast. Yes? And that's why... Yeah, Dude, so it's... Really Sorry? I, I, I couldn't hear then, so maybe he should lower the volume down because there's a bit of feedback. Yeah, you turn up your mic because I have my audio now at like 80% instead of you 50 so i can hear him but <laughs> yeah in any sense let's continue in 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 the the direction that you know with, with high frequency that's what uh you also why you get stronger maybe faster because you get to practice a lot more often so not once a week bench but you know right now for me it's four times a week bench and it's been going really really well but yeah. i also got uh, one question to ask you because um, you mentioned it earlier that a lot of people uh, think they're more advanced than they are and sometimes um, someone sends you know to us a split to to check out if it's okay and then it's 12 compounds per day six days a week and it's like wow five mm -hmm. sets per exercise that's way too much so what is the concept of full body because it's not you work every muscle directly but maybe use you know, certain compounds to hit a couple of muscles, even ones that are not that obvious. Right. Yeah. So the central principle uh, of the Bayesian bodybuilding high frequency method is that you increase a muscle's training frequency uh, more and more as it gets more advanced. And this is muscle specific because it's at the muscle specific level. It's your biceps and at your whole body, for example, that become stronger, more resistant to muscle damage. Uh, also more resistant to metabolic stress, clears lactate quicker, and uh, due to an increase in satellite cell number and in general myogenic cell activity, it can recover faster. So the more advanced a certain muscle group is, the more developed it is, the higher uh, the weekly training frequency for that muscle group you should implement. So it's many people, they they. You know, they've been on my Facebook and they see this uh, client that made it to the newspaper and she was doing full body work and had great results as per the DEXA scan. Or they've, you know, in my PT course, there's a program for um, a power lifter that used that program and uh, it made him national champion. And then people think of these extreme cases, you know, like full body every day is very different from what you often hear. And they think, okay, that is the high frequency training method from Bayesian bodybuilding, but that is only for the most advanced individuals. And you're not taking a regular kind of, um, say, three days per week training program, and then you're just turning it into six days. So full body training was actually popular when most lifters were still natural in the like a 40s, 50s, that era. And it became a lot less popular, um, actually coinciding quite well with the rise of steroid use in bodybuilding but if you take a program like that like full body when you do three times a week and you start doing that program every single day then you get a way excessive program generally so I mean you still want uh, similar levels of optimal training volume so you should strongly differentiate distinguish between training volume and training frequency uh, like you say, in a more advanced lifter, often to mitigate uh, muscle damage and make sure someone still recovers, you want to have, you want to hit the exercises or muscle groups specifically from different angles. Use exercises that, uh, for example, if your squat is very important, then you probably do not want to do uh, heavy high volume split squats the day right before because they induce a lot of muscle damage and that will limit your squats a lot. So if you have a setup uh, where, for example, you have a free split and you're doing squats, split squats and leg extensions for your quads, then I generally put the squid, split squats after the squats and do something like blood flow restriction, uh, leg extensions the day before the squats, because those uh, are very easy to recover from. So that ensures that someone is fresh um, and can achieve high performance on the squat day which is the most important of the exercise, at least as a benchmark of progression. 
So with these kind of subtle uh, changes in exercise selection and uh, the ordering of exercise across the week uh, and taking into account total volume, you can design uh, programs with a lot higher training frequency than you commonly see online, like upper, upper, lower, push, pull, legs, those kind of splits. Um, and they are very, very effective, as you say. Yeah, I think, Stan, Stan, are you online? Yeah, no, yeah, okay, no, okay. no way. Because you had a, a bit of an error there, but yeah. So, um, what's what, what, what are your thoughts, and this is something that some people have asked, of even doing it twice daily? Because we've experimented with this twice a day training, so even hitting a muscle twice a day, that sounds extreme, but there's actually a rationale, and it actually works for some people so mm -hmm. that would be really interesting to hear yeah there's some research uh, especially in olympic weightlifters that shows benefits to uh, going as far as training twice a day and it's actually a quite common practice uh, in elite athletes of various sports in my experience most people do not need uh, to bother with this uh, unless they are elite level lifters so it's definitely not the case that you need to do it, but I think in certain elite lifters, uh, women in particular, because of the gender difference that they are more tolerant to muscle damage generally and they recover faster from training, uh, they seem to tolerate it uh, very well. And it's especially true if your volume is so high, um, which generally coincides with being a very advanced lifter, that um, if you do it all in one session, then the quality of the work isn't very high. That's a, a great benefit of high frequency training in general. Most people, they do um, a program like you just described, like they have inclined bench press and then decline bench press and then dips and then flies. And by the time you get to the dips and the flies, you know, your chest is destroyed and the quality of the work is very low. So technique isn't good. Um, there's actually also research showing that muscle damage impairs uh, proprioception so the ability to maintain technique even if you cannot really notice it you know the movement looks the same from the outside but internally there may be more friction in the joints for example so um, and you can easily notice it just in total work output you know once you've done free exercises for your your pecs and they are already um, uh, swollen uh, and damaged then by the time you get to flies, if you compare then how much weight you can lift and how much total tonnage you can get in free sets uh, of the flies, you compare that with when you do them separately on a different day, it's very different. So you get a lot higher quality work and you can get a lot higher work output, also, also more time efficient if you um, train with higher frequency. And for twice a day training, you get the benefit that almost every exercise you do is still performed quite fresh. So the quality of your work is really high. And mentally, uh, a lot of people also uh, find it very enjoyable for that reason. Because as you've, as you've noticed, you know, when you become quite advanced and you've done a few sets of heavy squats, then you know, you're pretty gassed out already. And you can rest a few minutes and it's fine and go on with your workout. But with a high frequency training setup, you can make it so that you never have to perform a lot of your workouts in this fatigued state. Yeah, so you can squat in the morning and do uh, some other workout in the evening. Yeah, so yeah, the question is if you want to, um, some um, something you, you touched on earlier as well, if you want to uh, train the same muscle groups or different muscle groups. And I think that mostly depends for a bodybuilder. You probably don't want to hit the same muscle groups twice um, it's mostly for powerlifting strength sports that um, you separate uh, or people who recover really fast, like certain very advanced women, that you hit the same muscle group twice a day. Otherwise, I generally split the muscle groups uh, when I do twice a day training in certain lifters. So um, for Olympic lifting and powerlifting, it may make sense to uh, do the bench press separately, for example, give it a whole separate session. And then afterwards, later in the day, you still do push-ups to get more volume in, for example. But uh, for a bodybuilder, you do the push-ups and a bench press, say, in the afternoon. And then later in the evening, you'd be performing, say, squats and leg extensions. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of 
exercise ordering because we know that's super important but you also have um at least we've learned this from you the the paired sets where it's not exactly a super set but it's mm -hmm. strategically fitting certain exercises together so you save time on your workouts but you also hit them with almost the same priority so can you elaborate on that maybe right sure uh, paired sets, as I call them, like researchers uh, generally don't use very consistent terms here. Um, they're basically the, you get the advantage of supersets, which is you save a lot of time. But the problem with supersets is that, you know, once you get to a reasonable strength level, uh, you simply cannot perform two exercises back to back with a lot of intensity. Like I said, if you're doing a heavy set of squats and then right afterwards you have to do a heavy set of bench presses, it's just not going to happen for it an elite level lifter. So a novice might do fine, you know, they still have the ability, they don't induce that much fatigue yet, so, and they're still very enthusiastic, so they can bounce from the squat to the bench press and do well. But a uh, power lifter, it's not gonna, you know, if you have a power lifter perform the squat and the bench press, one RMs, like right back to back, they're gonna get the same numbers. So um, that's the disadvantage of supersets. And if you simply allow a bit more time uh, in between sets of the different exercises as well, not just after the last uh, part of the superset, then you still save a lot of time, but you also get the benefit that you can prioritize more exercises. For many people, they go for a workout um, sequentially, which means you do all of your sets of squats, then you do all of your sets of bench presses, then you do all of your sets of uh, pulls, rows, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. But if you would pair them up, you would do one set of squats, one set of bench presses, one set of rows, one set of squats, one set of bench presses, one set of rows, etc. Then you are more fresh when you do your first set of bench presses in the workout. You're not doing your uh, first set after you've, uh, you're already pretty gassed out from all the squats. So this technique and more relevant when you're training with uh, lower training frequencies, because like I say, then sometimes when you get to certain exercises in your program, you're already very fatigued. Um, and importantly, the muscles are fatigued. It's not just a mental thing. So um, we find in research generally that exercises that are put first in the workout, they progress faster than exercises that are put later on in the workout, especially if they are for the same muscle group, which makes sense because then the interference is a lot more direct. So by pairing up exercises strategically uh, for different muscle groups, generally, then you can prioritize more exercises in the program than just one. And that is, um, I think, very valuable, especially in practice, because most people do not have a program where they train twice a day uh, and have the luxury of you know, making each exercise um, its own workout, basically. Yeah, that's, and it's actually a, a great technique. We've been having great results with it. And also on the topic of two-day training, it's something that um, I wanted to ask. Is also, it really depends on, on if your lifestyle can support it. And actually, many people don't realize how important lifestyle is. And you've stressed quite a lot on it in the course. So can you for the remainder of the, this, um, this uh, interview, because you have only a couple of minutes left. Can you please tell us on what are your ideas on, on lifestyle, sleep, food, et cetera? If you can just crunch it all up, just mm -hmm. the main points. Sure, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll skim through the, the important stuff. Um, I think, indeed, uh, lifestyle factors, they are far, far more important than many people give them credit for. Uh, many people have this idea, you know, that sleep, it's, you know, and stress level even more. It's, it's, it's important, yes, but, you know, deep down they think not really, right? So, um, you know, yeah, yeah, you need your sleep, but when it comes to going to bedtime, it's like, yeah, you know, uh, you, you have other stuff to do, right? You don't want to go to bed. So um, it's very common for people in our current society to sleep, you know, five, six hours a night most days, and then they catch up a little on the weekends. Uh, but we actually find in research that sleeping 5.5 hours on average compared to 8 hours on average angles every single day or across the week on average is uh, results in over 50% more muscle loss and over 50% less fat loss during a weight loss diet. So that is 
a huge difference. And we've also got research on stress levels that acute academic stress. And there's also research on psychological stress, I believe. Some, um, so there's like a personal issue people experience. Um, and academic stress would be like a deadline coming up where you have to hand in a paper if you're a student or it would be similar if you have an important deadline at work. And this induces mental stress, even if you don't really experience it necessarily as, you know, distressful. And we find in research that this mental type of stress can cut your recovery capacity in half. So it actually takes twice as long to recover from the same workout if you are stressed at work compared to when you're just chill all day. And these kind of factors, they, which means that training frequency, training volume, these kind of things, they have to be adapted to someone's recovery capacity and lifestyle is a big proponent of that. And that's not even to mention compliance, which, you know, adherence with a diet and a lifestyle. I think one of the most important things I prioritize in many of my programs is that I have people focus on being happy. And it sounds so cliche and corny, you know, but if you are happy and you are loving the life that you live, then it is so much easier to diet, to watch your food choices, um, to get plenty of sleep. Everything in life is so much easier and not just training and nutrition, but it also extends to other realms. So it's, it's win-win. And I think a lot of people neglect these things and just focus on, you know, how many sets of biceps girls they're doing and how much grams of, how many grams of carbohydrate they're eating at lunch. And they forget these big picture lifestyle consistency, you know, meal planning, how much sleep they're getting, their stress level, these kind of things. And they are a lot more important than people give them credit for. Yeah, it really makes a world of difference. And that's super, super interesting. Like, I'd love to talk with you a lot more, to be honest, but that, I think that's all the time we have today. Uh, you have other engagements to attend to. So with that, I would say that we, we're eagerly waiting for you to come to give your lecture here. And uh, I think that's all from my side. So Stan, if you have any last words. Yeah, uh, it was a, a big pleasure for me to talk with you now. And uh, I can't wait to see you live on Zoom. Uh, yeah, my pleasure, guys. I look forward to uh, seeing you in Sofia. Really excited to come to Bulgaria. Awesome. Thanks, Menno. Talk to you soon. All right. See you. Bye.